Friday night. Should we get into some of the big stories of the week? Take a bit of a breath, decompress, and take our eye across some of the things we've been talking about. Let's do that right now with uh, Alice Watson-Brown, who is a political commentator. Jason Reed as well, who is the founder of Young Voices UK. Alice, Jason, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Real pleasure. Jason, are you all right? Great, thanks, Daryl. Great to be with you again. Good man. Uh, absolutely. Thank you for having us on. Thank you for being with us. Um, uh, before 11 tonight, I want to get into this story about the police. A really interesting story kicking about today. Uh, a report from MPs that have suggested that the police are uh, have um, uh, succumbed to systemic failures in tackling uh, inequalities in the police force. We'll talk about the X Factor as well. Shall we start with uh, the thing that's really got some tongues wagging this week? Um, COVID status passes are, are now a thing. Um, if you go on your COVID app or your, or it's not even the COVID app, I think it's the, it's the NHS app that you can get um, a, a COVID passport and you put your details in. If you've been double jabbed or you've had a test, uh, you can now get your status checked. And it looks as though some of those uh, big events, big domestic events, um, and certainly travel will require you to have one. Um, Jason, are you going to get yours? Absolutely, I will. I, I think it's a a miracle that we have this technology available. If, if the pandemic had hit 40, 50 years ago, we wouldn't have had the technology to develop a vaccine in the first place so so quickly and so safely, let alone the technology to quickly prove with the scan of an app that we are immunized. We should be celebrating the technology that we have with vaccine passports because it, it delivers a best of both worlds situation. It means that we can reopen everything. We can get the economy going again. We can resume normal life and at the same time we can be sure that everyone is as safe as they possibly can be and as healthy as they possibly can be when you weigh up the costs and the benefits it seems to me that there's a huge benefit and no cost there's no cost to getting vaccinated it's free it takes a few minutes and the benefit is enormous because it means we come out the other side of the pandemic okay alice i i assume you're going to feel a bit differently cost to benefit your uh, jason says is uh, is is worth us doing. And by the way, Alice, while you do that, I'm going to try and get my COVID pass. I'm going to try and do it live uh, on the radio right <laughs> well, <good> now. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to try and input my details. Go on. What do you think? Uh, well, I agree with Jason in the sense that vaccination is easy, but I think that's a very different uh, kettle of fish to vaccine passports. Um, there's been a lot of white noise about them. People have been concerned about them for very good reason. Uh, the vaccine minister strenuously denied that we were going to have them. And then guess what? Another U-turn. Um, and I think the shaky uh, justifications for these have been rattled with the fact that cases there are cases present among the vaccinated. They do not prevent transmission. Uh, so in July, on July 22nd, 40% of hospital admissions were doubly vaxxed. So you cannot have a zero COVID policy, which is what these vaccine passports are pushing for. Um, and because of the lack of coherence on, on, on the science of transmission, medical freedom should be the default. And I think this is a huge attack on the right to personal choice. We are already seeing- but you have choice. You have choice, don't you, Alice? You have choice to get vaccinated or not. And also the other thing, the other really important point about these as well, that I've only just noticed, uh, having looked at the details on my COVID app now, is that it's not just about having a vaccine. It's also about having a test. So if, if for whatever yeah. reason you can't have a vaccine or you don't want to have a vaccine, you can do a test to prove you're negative before you go into an event that this will get you into. Yeah, but I think this the narrative that's a problem. The goalposts have been continuously moved. The vaccination was meant to be the saviour, um, the point where all restrictions ended, um, but they haven't. And as Sir Desmond Swain put it very correctly, tyranny is a habit and the government hasn't quite break, bro broken it. Um, and we're already seeing the start of a two-tier society from these vaccine passports. You know, Costa today, um, they lead to medical discrimination. Students um, may not be able to attend their in-person lectures. So people my age and 2 million people in the UK will not be able to attend in-person lectures on account of a medical or personal medical choice. Imagine if that was applied to sexual health going into nightclubs. You have to declare, oh, I tested negative for chlamydia last week. I can be let in. Um, you know, and I <laughs> well, I, yeah, why not? It's the same thing. <laughs> why not? Well, okay, listen, no, no, I, I take your point, uh, uh, Alice. By the way, I can't do it uh, live on the radio <laughs> because uh, you need your NHS number. 
and who's got their NHS number? What is it? Who's got an NHS? What even is that? I can barely remember my own PIN number, my own phone number. <laughs> Never mind the NHS number. So I might have to do that another time. Jason, Alice makes this this. And listen, listen. I've I sort of come down relatively uh, on on your side here, Jason, and, and and I'm sort of relatively open to the idea of a, a vaccine passport as a tool to help get us through uh, this difficult period of our lives. In fact, I've been on the television and I've debated that, Jason. So my cards are fully on the table. But Alice makes this compelling point, doesn't she, about about freedom and about um, about where this potentially leads us. This sort of niggling sense that that that, that asking people to 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 demonstrate something about their health before they go into um, a, a big event or a concert or a sports place is just not somewhere we want to be. I, I don't buy into this uh, slippery slope argument that if we give one piece of information about ourselves to the NHS app, then we're going to give up our whole lives before we know it. This is a one-off event. It's a once in a generation, once in a lifetime um, pandemic that we've had a novel virus ripping through the population. And it makes sense to make it uh, to make it make sense for people to get vaccinated. The, the vaccine take up among the young has been unfortunately quite slow. Um, and so I think Governments U-turn all the time, but in this case, it makes sense for them to um, nudge people in the right direction to point out that going to nightclubs or going to in-campus, on-campus um, teaching at university might become a bit more difficult if you're not vaccinated. Because I don't think young people are failing to take up the vaccine because they're all 5G conspiracy theorists. It's because it's a convenience issue. And so little things we can do to make it that little bit easier and to encourage people to do it, it, it benefits everyone. Okay, um, Alice, pick up on that point from Jason, that actually, as much as anything, this also incentivizes those people to get the jab, to keep themselves and the, their communities safe, not because they don't want to, or not because, just because they don't really see the importance of it, where science tells us that it is important for those people to get the vaccine, and this might help nudge them in the right direction. Uh, I, I respectfully disagree. It's not a nudge, it's coercion. Um, so I'm talking from the perspective of university students here. I am one, you know, I, I've seen COVID in universities. Most students have had COVID. Um, and the only okay, reason is that, is, that a, have... is that a fact? Most, that's quite a big thing to say. Most well, okay, students have I don't have COVID. a statistical backup for that, <laughs> but <laughs> my friendship group, okay. like the group I hang out with. People in your, people in your friends, COVID. your friends have had yes. COVID. Okay. Um, and they part every week, they would publish the COVID stats on a university email, which no one obviously ever read. Um, but they, they would keep track. <laughs> Um, and um, the only reason why they got the vaccination is not because they thought they needed it, it was because they were worried they wouldn't have a livelihood. Um, and I do not think that is a good reason but to encourage do, people but it, but it, but it to get something. And I think but that when you sort said, of is though, isn't it, Alice? Because we do know that we know we know if we know two things, it's that the vaccine is safe and safe for them, and that if they have it, it will benefit all of us. And we also know that they are perhaps less likely to have it because they don't feel like they are necessarily at risk of getting COVID or getting ill from COVID. But we know that the vaccine is much more about that. It's much more about protecting the community and and, and protecting an ease of transmission and protecting against hospitalizations, etc. So I'm wondering, I'm just wondering what the you call it coercion, but but I'm wondering what the what the downside is of, of coercing people into having a vaccine? Well, it just massively undermines the importance of personal choice, which is, you know, it's a key part of our liberal democracy. Um, and when you said that, you know, this vaccine, it's a not an individual thing, it's a community thing. I would agree with you if it wasn't for the fact that vaccinations do not stop transmissions and hospitalizations. Well, it does. It does. Well, they do. It, they do do that. That's, that is literally what they do. They may cater, they may taper it, but they do not stop it. Well, they they help to prevent hospitalizations, and we're actually getting quite a lot of data at the moment that tells us that they do prevent transmission, or they do at least thwart transmission. Mm. But I think, but that's different because young young students, they are not in wider society. University students are still going to be transmitting this to each other, whether they're vaxxed or not, and we'll still have to stay home if they're ill or isolate if that's still you know if they change the policy for that so what, what about the what, vaccines okay. are not enough okay if we really want to have a community protection scheme for a zero covid society well, well, well let's let's park the issue of zero covid uh, for a moment because it, it sort of warps our thinking slightly but what about what about the the, the testing element I'll, I'll i'll root us back around to the, the fact that this covid passport uh, alice has 
a test attached to it. So if you don't have the vaccine, you can't take the vaccine, you don't want the vaccine. If you go into a sports a sports place, it's about checking your status. And your status is either that you are vaccinated and therefore you, you, you do reduce the risk of transmission or you reduce the risk of it being a problem for uh, our health service if you get the virus, or you go in there knowing at least to a degree that you don't have it. So it's much more about status, isn't it? I, I agree with that. And I think testing, if people are still worried about it, especially private events and things like that, they have every right to ask their attendees to test. But I still think that it, it, it invades on personal choice. You should be able to go somewhere without declaring your health status. What about my choice to be able to go into somewhere without you having the virus or without mixing with people who are, who are unwell or, uh, or, or will put my health infrastructure at risk? Well, by your logic, the vaccination should, if you've been vaccinated, then that should prevent well, it'll you prevent, getting it'll prevent Ill. it will it will prevent me from getting uh, seriously unwell but it might not prevent you from getting seriously unwell and it will uh, or you not having it or not having a status check as you go in will mean that you could get unwell and you will put you, you'll put a strain on our health infrastructure and where's my freedom well, you know when you talk when we talk about freedom we've had our freedom taken away from us isn't this just one of those tools that's given it to us back I disagree. I, I, I do disagree. I think that if you go somewhere where you do not have to declare your health status, that's a matter of choice. Um, you People get ill. It's a fact of life. And for people my age, they do not get severely ill. Um, not many people do die. I'm not saying that it's not serious, but, but, but for but, a vast majority of us, it, it's... It, it doesn't affect about? our daily lives. I mean, I've had talk... COVID twice. No, hang on a minute, um, hang, and... hang on a minute, Alice. Hang on a minute, Alice. We, we know the profound effects of the spread of this virus. We know the profound effects of this virus. This is not a flu. It's a respiratory illness that we still don't know a huge amount about. Um, and having it spread through the population is, is something that we want to avoid. Uh, it just is. And this is something that ultimately it will help to prevent. Scientifically, possibly, um, but still, it's shaky with the um, transmission rates among the vaccinated. But you're talking about the NHS app with, uh, you know, declaring the virus, declaring your virus status and your health status and things like that. Well, Julia Hartley Brewer on on the show on her show this week um, sort of brought up the fact that the NHS app now has tabs to declare your lifestyle, who you hang around with, um, you know, alleged criminal offences that that's on the co the nhs app with the covid um with the but covid you don't, but, you don't, but you don't have to put put that sort of stuff in do you go on jason what are you saying there is there's no disagreement within the science at all that being vaccinated is much much better for yourself and for everyone else than being unvaccinated and so more people being vaccinated is a is a good thing and it's as simple as that um, there are lots of things you can't do because it endangers someone else's health or someone else's safety. You can't drive drunk, for example. There's, a, there's a, clearly a balance to be found between, on the one hand, allowing people to be free and to live their lives the way they want to, and on the other hand, making it so that people don't have to be scared when they go out and when they live their life in, in the way that they want to, because other people around them have, frankly, inconsiderately done something to put their health in danger. If you're going to a university campus and you're unvaccinated, which means there's a much higher probability of you carrying the virus and you're brushing shoulders with uh, lots of different people, interacting with how many different people. Um, you don't know how vulnerable they might be. You don't know whether they might be hospitalized or they might die if they get that virus from you. There's a huge downside to having unvaccinated people walking around, but there's, there's no upside to it. Alice, you, you've had it twice. Do you not want to not get it again? Well, well, okay, so A is very rare to get it twice. I mean, I think 5% of the population or something. It's funny, um, it's funny. If we, if we, tra special. trade in an anecdote, actually. I, I know quite a few people who've got it twice. In the same way yeah, you know quite a few um, students who've had it. I know quite a few people who've had it twice. It seems to be quite rife, that. Yeah. Um, I think the second time I had it was the Delta variant. I mean, to be honest, I mean, if, if I wasn't vaccinated, in theory, um, I, I would just sort of... You know, well, I, I've had it twice, so why? And I recovered from it quite well. For me, I just thought I had a chest infection, needed to stay in bed for three days. But now I had seven days of just milling around my student flat doing nothing. 
it made me more sort of mentally sort of um, <laughs> set well, back. Exactly. And all, all the more reason to not get it, right? All the more reason. All of these are good, really compelling reasons. Not least because we don't want to be bored in our flats for a week or our houses uh, whilst we recover from it. Uh, listen, uh, Alice, hang on there. Uh, Jason as well uh, with us tonight. Jason Reed, founder of Young Voices. Alice Watson Brown, political commentator on Talk Radio tonight on the Friday panel. Us, uh, Alice Watson Brown, political commentator, and Jason Reed, founder of Young Voices UK. Join us tonight on the Friday panel. We're taking a look through some of the big stories that was certainly one of them another really interesting story uh, that has been that was on the front page of the guardian this morning i think as well a major report I don't know if you saw this by mps that's criticized the police for not doing enough to fix what it describes as systemic failures uh, on race and uh, unjustified inequalities as well as that, we've obviously seen this uh, uh, the big stories around the Met Police officers uh, currently being probed over inappropriate uh, WhatsApp messages. Questions still remain over how Sarah Everard's uh, killer uh, remained in the police force despite prior offences. Uh, and there was a report literally uh, earlier this month that re regarded the Met Police as institutionally corrupt. Um, Jason, have we got the wrong people in the police force? I think I'm afraid the issue is uh, much more fundamental than that. Um, in the aftermath of George Floyd's death, when people were marching through the streets in response, they were not holding placards saying the police need to change their hiring practices. They were saying the police need to be defunded. Um, it's an institutional issue. I'm not saying the police does need to be defunded, but there's clearly some fundamental things that uh, run through the fabric of our society and which manifest most clearly um, through the way that we police our society and uh, it, it's a fundamental issue which doesn't have an easy solution but it, it, we need to ask some very difficult questions and, in order and, to be able to start to solve and that. jason when you say when you when you say the way that we police our society what do you mean by that what practices can you point at to say that are flawed well i think it, the, the report highlighted uh, various practices that are flawed but that we cling on to um like stop and search like putting people in prison for drugs offences and that kind of thing um, and that's what's causing these uh, these discrepancies these disparities in the number of young black people for example who end up in prison um, we as a society we are condemning entire groups of people entire sections of the population um, to to lives of crime to lives of depri deprivation completely unnecessarily because we still have this um, this draconian, this outdated way of thinking about how we punish criminal offences, what we deem to be criminal offences. Um, uh, okay, Alice, pick up on that then. It, 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 those practices, the way that they do things, the hiring practices, the people that we've got on the top and perhaps even on the beat, is the, t is the police from top to bottom getting it wrong? Well, you talk about hiring practices, and as far as I'm aware from people who I know who've gone into the police force, it's all based on meritocracy, physical fitness, mental state. Um, I don't think it's designed to draw in racists or people who have sick views that are not really reflected in normal society. Um, I think we also have to consider that the police is a public sector with a hugely important job. And it's obviously going to be under a lot more scrutiny than normal professions, especially as Jason said, considering the modern cultural forces which exploded after, after George Floyd. Um, and the worrying thing about the sort of the awful actions of police officers and the incarceration rates among um, certain minorities, of the population, is that the police are meant to rep they're meant to be sort of a microcosm of wider society. So does that mean that there are that there are the amount of bad police officers are the same as in normal society? But I don't think that it's that the wrong people climb to the top. There are gross misconducts in every profession. It's just the actions of these police officers impact people's lives every day. And not just, not just so, oh, it's a one-off, but they stop people from living their lives by imprisoning them or by stopping and searching them and taking them away. Um, oh. is, there, is, talking... there, is, is there something though, just on that point, Alice, if we take a step back, is there something about the role of a police officer, the power that it comes with, the uniform, uh, the the you know the patrol in the streets the being involved in big protests and, and big moments like quite a lot of it's pretty boring I think uh, filling in paperwork and you know dealing with dealing with really minor stuff uh, like bins being nicked and stuff like that I imagine but there's just a little bit of something about the the heat and the excitement that brings out a primal part of people that gets nasty and unpleasant. 
I agree. It's, yeah, you said it's primal. It's I'm in control here and I have the power to ruin or take away these people's lives. And maybe that power, they need to teach greater responsibility within their police officers of how to react to those sort of primal instincts that they have. Um, but I think, I don't know, I think it's a lot more nuanced, a lot more multifaceted than just saying the whole institution is corrupt or the whole institution is wrong because in my mind, all the whole institution is racist because that takes away... Well, that's what away. the panel said. The pa that panel said that it was institutionally corrupt and that there were systemic failures. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think it's that generalizations like that take away from the real individual problems. Um, I think this, the tragic Sarah Everard case um, I do not think represents the police as a whole. Um, I, I do think there was there was wrongdoing for the Met Police for not firing um, the police officer concerned because obviously demonstrated some sinister um, motives beforehand, you know, with indecent in exposure. And I think in 2015, he was supposedly spotted in, in, a, in a car naked from the waist down. Um, it's an error from the Met, but also proved he was a sick individual independent from the ethos of the police force. Um, so yeah, perhaps there should be increased vetting and more um, mental examinations of the police officers they hire and more trial periods and sort of more um, measures in place to really hold these officers accountable. Um, but I think, as I said, there are gross misconducts in every office. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's um, that's, that's, a, that's a fair point. Yes, and does Alice have a point there that there are bad apples? There are there are people. There are bad actors in in all kind of corporations. And actually, maybe there is something about the the police force that attracts a certain type of person onto the ground. And it perhaps perhaps less less so that it attracts a certain type of person, but it brings a certain primal thing out of people. But the idea that it is institutionally corrupt or that there are systemic failures, as this uh, this MP's report has said today. Um, is is a step too far? Well, there certainly are bad apples, and there are things that can be done in the short term on a small scale to um, to improve the the way that the police behave on a day to day basis. But uh, the problem, I think, runs much much deeper than that. It's not just about it's not just that the people who apply to the police are more prone to this kind of behaviour. It's the way the police acts as an institution. It is an institutional issue, in my opinion. It's a policy issue that goes right to the top. We need to somehow uh, get over this cultural attitude that we have of um, punishing people for the sake of punishing them. Of um, When you look at the polling data, people generally are in favour of punishing people harder than they are being punished at that time, however harsh that punishment might be. Um, we need to somehow progress in a way that we've progressed in other areas of society into a more compassionate um, and a more socially focused way of thinking about justice which focuses on rehabilitation and which would do something to um, to counteract the awful reoffending rates that we have at the moment when uh, at the moment people go to prison they come back out and they reoffend again because this cycle that we have that we that we put them in doesn't help anyone we need to move past prison being the 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 one size fits all the only solution to everything okay really interesting uh there you go see we've reworked the entire prison system uh, and policing from top to bottom on a friday night uh why not uh jason stay there uh, alice as well uh, uh, jason reed is with us alice watson brown political commentator and jason reed founder of young voices uk late night with daryl morris on talk radio 10 to 11, our Friday panel with us tonight. Jason Reed, founder of Young Voices UK, and Alice Watson Brown, a political commentator. We'll talk about X Factor in a sec. Uh, we've also been talking about vaccine passports tonight. Uh, it's a thing. I tried to do it on my phone, but I need my NHS number, which is just not a thing. It's called, what is it? What is an NHS? I don't even know how an NHS number. What even is that? What does that mean? Um, so I can't do it to demonstrate it, but, um, but I think I will be. I think it's a decent idea. Craig is in Glasgow. Uh, Craig, good evening. Good evening, uh, Daryl. Good evening to to your guests as well. Vaccine passport, um, my friend, are you going to be signing up? What do you think? Yeah, well, I think personally, um, look, number one to say is I am all in favour of vaccines and I think everyone should get a vaccine. You know, I, I do believe firmly in that. My problem is twofold. One, I think it should be a choice and I think vaccine passports eliminates a lot of people from that choice. But I also worry that if this is to be the case, and you need it for nightclubs and pubs, the government will inevitably down the line, if there's a spike of cases or whatever, start to make it something that you need 
for other places that you go, whether it be the local Asda's or the Tesco or whether it be the cinema, you know, or any number of the town centre or any number of other places. And that becomes an issue because you could get to a point where actually most places you go will require you to have a vaccine passport. And that's an issue because then it's no longer a choice for anybody whether they get a vaccine. It's also interfering with private businesses' right to choose whether they want someone in their business or not as well. So that's my concern. And I just don't trust this government to stop at nightclubs and pubs. And I, I, I really don't think many people would. Okay. There's not a reason to. Okay, Alice is nodding along. Jason, pick up on that point then from Craig. Craig thinks that it's going gonna, it's gonna to escalate, that it will start with big events and we can all agree, giving ourselves, giving our vaccine passport as we go into a nightclub is one thing, uh, into a, a shop might be another and he's worried that it's going gonna, it's gonna to escalate and he doesn't trust the government to get it right. Well, like I said before, I, I don't buy into the slippery slope argument, I'm afraid. You can apply this to... You can apply, you apply that logic to anything. In the 60s, when there was a debate about whether to legalise gay sex or not, people said, oh, no, if we do that, then we'll have to legalise paedophilia and bestiality and all sorts of other things. Of course, that never materialises. This is a one-off event. It's just to smooth the transition out of the pandemic to make sure that everyone stays as safe as they can. Um, and there isn't a legitimate reason, unless you have a medical exemption, of course, there isn't a legitimate reason not to get vaccinated anyway and so policies like this that nudge people in the right direction it's not some grand scheme to take away our freedom and to you know so seize our liberties for the greater good i don't see it wouldn't be in the government's interest to do that anyway i don't see a scenario in which that happens craig if there was a if there was a sunset clause on it say 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 it was um it was only applicable until this time next year would that make it any better for you would that put you uh, 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 you put your mind at rest uh, frankly, no, because again, you know, you could put a, a sunset clause in all you like. Is you know, they, this is a government that has such a sizable majority that any time they fancy changing it, they can and will do that. Now, the other issue is when this comes in, how long before one of Boris Johnson's MPs gets caught going in, in a, a venue without a passport? Because we already know they don't believe in following the rules we do. Boris himself just a few months ago, said that he would eat a vaccine passport. Now, all of a sudden, it's his flagship policy for, for COVID going forward. You know, th this is why you cannot trust him. Okay. It's a real credibility issue, okay, in so my it's, opinion. Okay, so it's, it's probably it's, uh, as much about trust, uh, clearly, for you, uh, Craig. Thank you for your call. Really nice to talk to you, Craig, in Glasgow, uh, in Glasgow tonight. 0344 499 1000. Talk in your message to 87222. Um, elsewhere tonight, uh, Alice Watson-Brown, Jason Reed on our Friday panel. Alice, the X Factor is gone. Are you, um, are you sobbing into a pina colada this Friday evening that the X Factor is no more? Um, if it that, if X Factor had been cancelled in 2008, I probably would have run home from school into my mom's arms and cried for about <laughs> the whole weekend. Um, <laughs> but I think it was a long time coming. I think viewing rates were at a record low in 2017. Um, it decreased more than 10 million for the final in eight years, which is huge. Um, I think the problem is the people who grew up with it on their screen, so my generation, we got older, we got hooked on new things. Our favorite cohort of original judges changed. Um, it was what we watched every weekend and everyone, everyone would be talking about it in school on a Monday morning. Um, also there are iconic videos of failed auditions, which is the only X Factor I really ever watch on YouTube. Um, but I think the cultural legacy of it, I mean, it's memories, childhood memories and shows a wide variety of talent and ambition, but it also shows the darker side of showbiz um, and that kind of lifestyle. Um, I think that was why every mom, when um, their child went to them at 12 years old, been like, Mommy, I want to audition for the X Factor. She says no. Um, so, yeah, I did mean, you, it is a force to be a five-star Hollywood actress. So that was definitely on my list. <laughs> Jason, as always kind of got a point there that, that perhaps it's the real story here is that is that culture has moved on and the X Factor didn't. Quite possibly, yeah. I, I, same as Alice, I remember watching it many years ago when I was a lot younger than I am now and I haven't watched it for a long time. Um, it's obviously going to leave a very long shadow. It dominated Saturday Night TV and set the tone in this country for Saturday Night TV for a long time. It's been exported to countless other countries, other similar shows like Britain's Got Talent, The Voice. They're all sort of in X Factor's shadow already, but and perhaps I'm giving it too much credit here, but I, I really like the core idea that sits behind the X Factor. When you strip away all the 
showbiz nonsense that it's shrouded in, you know, the flashing lights and the tabloid drama and all of that. And, and you boil it down to the essence of the concept, the nub of what it is, which is just people chasing their dreams. It's, it's quite nice in a way. If, if you're being very ridiculous, you might even compare it to the Olympics. It's, it's this kind of American dream thing where anyone can audition and we they have those shots of swarms of people in the streets queuing up to audition and then just a few weeks later on the very same show those same people would be signing extremely valuable record deals and their lives would be changed forever it's quite a nice quite a nice message and quite an uplifting uh, story to go on that's quite interesting because you've used the word nice a lot there to describe the x factor which is not a word that i would apply yeah. to it because it's because and i wonder if alice it, this was a, a big part of its problem as well is that it, it was it was just too nasty yeah i mean i think you don't really realize that when you're a child because you just see the glory of it all and the excitement but yeah i think when i rewatch the sort of like failed auditions now i just go these poor people you know they've been ridiculed for something that they they've wanted to come on and do, and they must have had they must have had a horrible time of it. After do you think do you think it made us do you think it made us nastier as a society? Do you think it made us nastier people? Yeah, I think because it was a time when you know social media was really blowing up and everyone started using it and everyone was allowed to express an opinion. Um, and I think that partners yeah that partners very badly with people who come on yeah and do make a fool of themselves. Um, and don't actually realize quite how many people out there are a watching them and b are able to feed back on their talent and i think mm. it was sort of maybe the start of uh, not trolling but you know a kind of the trend of being able to be horrible about people publicly like with with little mix and, and jesse nelson uh you know she had a horrible time of it and you think wow she's so lucky she was on there she's made some really cool friends she's in a really cool band or whatever mm. um but yeah her whole documentary i found it I found it quite heart wrenching, actually. Yeah. You know about people horrible comments about her body, which has nothing to do with what she's on there for. She's on there to sing and to show off her talent. Um, yeah, I think that was probably sort of the, yeah hand in hand with the trend of yeah. you know everyone just commenting on everything all the time. That, that is such an interesting thing about it, about it making it, it sort of gave people the license to be publicly horrible. I went to see uh, the X Factor filmed once this was a couple of years ago, obviously, and it was it was the bizarrest experience of of watching people up on stage who were kind of all right, weren't the best singer. This one woman wasn't the best singer, but the whole place went for her like it was this real nasty gladiatorial uh, strip down of this poor woman who was just up on stage doing her best. I'm just not sure that's a place we really want to be. Um, listen, we're out of time, but love to talk to you both. Let's do it again, hopefully. Uh, Alice Jason, thank you. Thank you. Uh, have a good night. Alice uh, Watson-Brown, Jason Reed, with us on the Friday panel on Talk Radio. Uh, thank you to you as well. A couple of comments will come.